The ruins found in modern Egypt are certainly very impressive, but how much do we really know about them for sure? The aim of this particular episode will be to show you that whatever little can be found about what we call ancient Egyptian ruins from uh, the various historic sources is actually unknown to most people, they have never even heard about it. While at the same time, most of the things that we have been told are kind of indisputable facts about the history of these ruins, most of that is either a far-fetched speculation or even deliberate lie. Kind of a red herring meant to put in a wrong riverbed all future attempts to find out who and why built all this. And the truth will be very shocking for those of you who listen very carefully till the end, because we see an entire passages of the Bible, not some something similar, but like real Bible passages written with hieroglyphs on the walls of these allegedly ancient Egyptian temples. And although that is well known and not disputed even by mainstream scientists, still the children in school continue to learn that these are 3000 years old buildings. Although it usually makes sense to always start with the beginning of the history of a given culture or civilization, in the case of Egypt, we'll start with the end, with the hope that it will make the realization of how little actually we know about Egypt less painful. Because we all tend to hang to our belief system, even when it's wrong, we tend to resist change. Because by honestly admitting that we've been wrong about something, in most cases, that reveals that we've been wrong about many other things. And that can be quite difficult to face. And so we start with the end. The end of the glorious so-called ancient Egyptian rulers was not in some far away forgotten time, thousands of years ago, but just a couple of hundred years ago, when the Mamelukes, the last genuine initiated keepers of this knowledge, were mercilessly slaughtered. No, they were not bloodthirsty demons, as they are telling us nowadays. This is what we are told by their murderers. And Napoleon, whom we have been told that went to give light to Egypt, his mission was actually to destroy physically as much as he could from the still standing ancient heritage. But we are told a different story today that he went there with a team of scientists to study the ruins. Yeah by lining up his soldiers to shoot the face of the Sphinx. This is a 500-year-old map, or a copy of it, kept in a museum in Nuremberg. The map depicts Constantinople, or nowadays Istanbul. We see quite an international crowd of ships so to say, in those ancient cities. Of course, we see a ship with a Muslim flag. Then there's a ship of a two-headed eagle, which has always been and is still nowadays on the symbols of many European countries. And the third one is a sphinx. A flag with a sphinx on it. Well, sphinxes have always been a symbol of Egypt, but why is there a Christian flag as well, next to the Sphinx? Let's take a look into this. When modern historians talk about the Mamelukes, these are the type of images they show us. While the contemporary artists depicted the Mamelukes in this way. So, as it is clearly visible from the mummified bodies found in the historic Egyptian burials and from the depictions on the walls of the temples, 
the people who built them were a really international crowd. Clearly, there were dark Africans, there were tanned people, there were blonde Caucasian people. Everything was there. And it is very important to understand that the Mamelukes were actually descendants, if not in a blood sense, then surely in the sense of culture, descendants of the Caucasian blonde people that we see depicted on the temples, which we called ancient Egyptian temples, but how ancient were they should be really questioned because of the Bible inscriptions on them. But even if they are, even if we assume that they are really a couple of thousand years old, still it is very interesting and even more interesting to see the evidence that I'm going to show you about the connections between this uh, culture, which I call uh, the culture of the survivors or maybe of the Hyperboreans, which also could mean Atlantis, because it is only a guess for now that uh, the Hyperboreans lived on in the area of the North Pole. The mainstream historians are telling us that the Mamelukes were slaves gathered from various countries in Asia. But this is just a modern fantasy. The sources of that time tell a completely different story. Mainstream historians are telling us that the Mamelukes were slaves gathered from various countries in Asia. But this is just modern fantasy. The sources of their time tell of a completely different story. The Egyptian historian Amin al Khali wrote an interesting book sometime in the middle of the last century, which consisted of materials that he collected from medieval Arabic historical chronicles. The name of the book is Relations Between the Inhabitants of Nile and Bulgan, between 12th to 14th century. And exactly this place, the region around the river Volga in nowadays Russia, that, according to the Book of Veles, is the place where initially the Slavic people landed. Was it from Hyperborea, from Atlantis, from space? We don't know, but they landed there first. And from over there, they spread all over the world. And interestingly enough, the most recent DNA samples taken uh, from uh, Paracas, Peru, mummies of red-haired and often uh, elongated skull mummies, they also show connection with the DNA of the people exactly of this region around the river Volga. So, in his book, Almin al-Holi, the Egyptian historian, quotes an Egyptian sultan, historic sultan, who says, we and the Tartars are of one plan and will never renounce each other. Further, we read that the ramifications issued by the Egyptian sultans were fully valid within the areas of the Volga, and so the merchants who traveled back and forth were free from paying the duties that were imposed on outside traders. In other words, the Mamelukes were treated as if it was a, all clans in the outside areas of the River Volga. For example, the Sultan of Masur, Kalamur, although lived in Egypt many years, he never found the need to learn Arabic language. His predecessor also needed a translator when he spoke Arabic. Hajib Ahmas Beshtak al-Kipchaki is one of the most famous emirs and he did not uh, find it suitable to use Arabic in his uh, palace and for that reason he also kept translators when he needed to communicate with the Arab-speaking uh, people of Egypt at that time. These are only some of the more interesting uh, examples and material supporting evidence and quotes which I found 
in the works of Anatoly Fomenko and his uh, new chronology project over there in his works, which are available, many of them even for free on internet, you can find much, much more supporting evidence. I don't agree, though, with all the interpretations of the new chronology team of this uh, obvious uh, evidence of connection between uh, the European and Asian cultures and Egypt. Connection doesn't necessarily mean that the people who originally came from the Volga region created this entire civilization which built the magnificent temples and megaliths at the delta of River Nile. There are other possible scenarios. For example, Egypt could have been a center of civilization and learning and knowledge even before the Hyperboreans got connected to it. We don't know, actually. We should not assume things. So, let's hear a few more quotes about the Mamelukes. Martin Baumgarten was a cavalier and a nobleman of the German Empire. He visited Egypt and uh, wrote down his first-hand witnessed accounts of the Mamelukes at the time before their official history was uh, fabricated. This is what he says. The Mamelukes are Christian. They baptize their children when they are born. And then he goes on giving uh, details about the exact ritual of a baptism and later on uh, says and so most of the Mamelukes come from various Christian nations like Germans, Albanians, Serbs, Italians and Spanish. Now let's see how Martin Baumgarten describes Ali Bey, the factual ruler of the Mamelukes that he met himself and um, tells us about uh, how he looked like. Ali Bey was around 45. His face was long and reddish. He was blonde. His eyes were big and very clear. His beard was somewhat reddish and uh, pointed. His eyebrows were dense. He was uh, wearing Turkish outfits and then he goes on describing his various turbans for various occasions. Yes. And this is not the only account of this uh, sort. 18th century chronicle written again by a person who saw the Mamelukes with his own eyes and that is Abd al-Rahman al-Jabati. He described Osman Aga who at that time was um, the so-called Turkish ruler of uh, Egypt as being blonde. This uh, photograph is taken in year 1905 and these are the daughters of the Egyptian Hedif Abbas Halim, Halimi Pasha who was remotely uh, related to the Mamelukes who were, who were wiped out some hundred years earlier. It illustrates what was the result of mixing Mamelukes with Arabic people. But what about modern descendants of the Mamelukes? Maybe they will tell us the real history. Or it will be interesting also how would they look like. Well, there aren't any. All the Mamelukes were slaughtered by those same colonial forces which slaughtered the samurais of Japan, the red-haired people of Peru and all other communities which kept some of the old knowledge and the old history. It's very convenient when you kill them all, then you can make up any story you wish about them and there will be nobody to object.
According to the official history, um, Egypt was freed from the oppressive Mamelukes uh, by the Western European military forces. And uh, let's see when uh, the Christian Western Europeans freed their Christian brothers, the Copts, in Egypt. What did they do with them? Normally, one would expect, if that situation was true, that uh, they would rejoice uh, meeting uh, other similarly minded people who glorified their Lord Jesus Christ. The truth is, they didn't care about any Jesus Christ. The monasteries laid in ruins, the churches were plundered, the leaders of the clergy no record of them. The Coptic Christianity was still pure. It still had the original message of Jesus Christ about how to modify the reality we live in with the power of our thoughts and intentions. The soldiers of the parasites quarantined the Coptic Christianity for some 50 years, waiting for one generation to die and forget the truth. And after that, they kindly allow it to revive itself and resurrect again, but with changed ideology. They removed the original message of Christ and substituted it with parasitic so-called Christianity, which emphasizes that uh, humans are slaves, powerless slaves. They cannot do anything but wait for some unknown mercy. Nobody knows if it will come and how, but you should wait because you cannot do anything else. You are powerless. So just wait, although you're not sure what you're waiting for, but you wait and while you wait, you the powerless slave. Don't forget to be obedient, otherwise God will be angry, of course. And don't forget to pay your taxes, of course. And all these philosophies are far away from the original teachings of Christ, who taught powerful techniques of learning how to use the magical powers which we all have. The ideology of the early Copts, those uh, before the Copt Reformation by the foreigners, their ideology was so near to the Egyptian ideology, or at least as much as uh, we can find out about it from the translated hieroglyphic texts, that even mainstream sources don't deny that the Copts are direct continuation of that line of thinking. But how could that be possible if uh, the so-called ancient Egyptian uh, culture, which uh, had that ideology, thrived thousands of years ago and the Copts relatively recently. As I explained earlier, one of the prime instruments in uh, fabrication of the fraudulent history was to drive important events and culture way back in the past to make them look unimportant and irrelevant to us. The kingdoms of the Egyptian pharaohs were also artificially shifted to the faraway past, but in reality, the last pharaohs were Christian themselves. Christ appeared in the already rotting from within society of the survivors to restore the truth. That is why the original pure Christianity was popular amongst the various cultures all around the globe, of whom the survivors were bedrock. And there is no wonder uh, that we see Christianity amongst the last uh, feral kingdoms of Egypt. Mainstream historians are uh, persistently trying to hide the very obvious and clear connection between the Copts and the pharaohs and the ambiguous phrases like, for example, they say the magical and medicinal literature of the Copts is a direct continuation of the ancient Egyptian one. Now listen to a short passage quote from these ancient Egyptian so-called magical texts. They don't even call them directly Christian because it will look silly. But here it is. Hor hor for Eleloi. Adonai, Yao Savov, Mikhail, Jesus, help us and our homes. Amen. This type of obviously Christian prayers they call 
magical spells of the pharaohs and as usual conveniently forget to tell us the exact quotes but we'll speak hours about its meaning and all this is done to bamboozle us to make us not notice the obvious connection between Christianity and the last pharaohs. This is one of the items in the burial of Tutankhamun. Is there any need of commentary? Well, this is a Christian cross. This could have been the dagger of the young pharaoh Tutankhamun. It is decorated with European animals. But of course we are not sure if it was really his because this uh, full uh, story with the alleged discovery of his tomb is uh, fake. But still some of the artifacts are genuine, not, not sure which ones exactly. And probably they were taken from another tomb in the vicinity of the actually forged tomb of Tutankhamun. Again, the team of Anatoly Fomenko studied this uh, tomb of Tutankhamun. They went there a few times and I think they have uh, the best resources on this matter because many have uh, discussed the possible forgery of this uh, alleged tomb discovery. Everybody knows that many of the ancient uh, Egyptian uh, paintings, or maybe at this point we should uh, stop calling them ancient, but since they are famous as being ancient, excuse me if sometimes I still say that by mistake, so those are full of crosses and if uh, somebody still doubts that those crosses by chance look like Christian crosses, here on this one you can see the Christian cross and in it. This is not exact the form. time when supposedly some uh, ancient Egyptian temples were subsequently converted into churches, as the mainstream historians cunningly try to convince us. Here is another Christian cross that they have uh, forgotten to hide and it's still visible amongst the ancient Egyptian uh, hieroglyphic uh, signs. And this is another one laying there in the corner in one of the ancient Egyptian uh, temples. Two ancient Egyptian statues with Christian crosses on their back. And these are Coptic images. The crosses are very, very similar to the Egyptian crosses. Here are a few more Egyptian Ankh crosses. And so, sometime in the end of the 18th century, some Jesuits are being sent to Egypt to start fabricating the future image of ancient Egypt as we know it nowadays and which is absolute historical fiction. Remember earlier it was exactly Jesuits who took a very active part in uh, fabricating the books that would uh, serve as the basis of the fictional history um, during the Reformation period. Egyptology as science started existing very, very late in the 19th century. At that time, the Scaliger version of history was already widely accepted as scientific and the Egyptologists were uh, forced to adjust everything to fit those mistaken axioms that were laying uh, the basis of the timeline of Scaliger and if they would uh, disagree with uh, the Scaliger timeline they wouldn't be employed as uh, official scientists anymore very much like today actually sometimes so-called ancient sources are quoted to support the Scaliger uh, Dash Pitavius timeline of Egyptian history. However, please be aware that, um, for example, the most uh, famous of them, the work of Manifon, is not available in original nowadays. 
And so, if you see some quote from uh, Manifon, well, it is very easy to uh, manufacture all of that, to fabricate it, because the original is no longer available. So you can put any fantasy and label it as coming from Manifon, no problem. And so is the situation with all other so-called uh, ancient sources. As far as the official history of the various dynasties and times of rule, uh, of reign of various pharaohs that was easily fabricated by Henry Bruch, who uh, approached the matter in a very practical way. He took various lists from uh, the temple carvings. Some of them definitely, some of them definitely def uh, were names of pharaohs. Others uh, was not sure, but uh, he. Uh, took some lists that he liked and also assuming, according to his liking, that those were only feathers. Others, they didn't fit so well, so declared them uh, mythical, uh, mythology, and did not include them. And then, uh, to fix easily the dates of their reign, he just decided that everybody has ruled 33 years, or to be more exact, 100 years for every three pharaohs. And that is how this uh, full history was cooked and ready to be, uh, it was ready to be served to the public as science. Egypt was one of the most important centers of the culture of the survivors. Over there, the knowledge of the magical abilities of the humans was uh, kept alive until few hundred years ago by Copts and Mamelukes, and that is why it was very important for the soldiers of the parasites to uh, distort the Egyptian history in such a monstrous way. And so people are confused. There is one thing in the history books, but the actual artifacts point towards a completely different story. And they don't know what to think. Did aliens build all this? Because according to history, we could not have built them. We were barely coming out from the monkeys. The myth that it was Champollion who deciphered the hieroglyphs is very popular. But if you delve even a little bit in history, you will easily find out that people were reading the hieroglyphs even before that. The problem with reading them the traditional way was that full passages with the Bible content were shining from the walls of the Egyptian temples and that was not allowed because those temples were artificially sent thousands of years back in history. There was a dictionary, so to say, guide how to read the hieroglyphs by Horapolo, and that was natural to exist because when in Egypt they um, shifted from uh, hieroglyphs to other writings, there was the need of a dictionary and Harapolo compiled it and it worked fine. If it was um, mistaken, then the result would be some sort of unintelligible text. But the result, people and researchers were using his dictionary to read uh, the inscriptions on the temples and the result was okay, it was uh, very sensible, but it was declared false because it did not fit the fabricated history of Scalinger and Pitavius. And they used a cheap trick to do it. First of all, they publicly declared that Horapol was wrong. He's just wrong. That was done, of course, using the usual magical mantra the scientists said, because modern people will believe anything if uh, this mantra is put in front of the statement. After that, it was publicly with and very loudly announced that Champollion, hurra hurra, has finally deciphered the hieroglyphs. And after the society was informed about that and believed it, then without much publicity within the scientific society only, it was confessed that, oh, but Harapul was a uh, right after all about so many things. And what are these so many things? Well, practically everything besides uh, the most uh, essential points, the most essential things, 
which they wanted to hide from people, like, for example, details of how the ancient Egyptians manipulated energy, so that we can't learn that as well. Also, they changed the meaning of some words, which clearly showed again and again that uh, the last pharaohs were Christians. But that worked only partially, because even in modern news, even very recently, again, oh, a new discovery, and yet another Bible text word to word inscribed on the ancient Egyptian temple wall. The modern history textbooks with great authority assure us that Napoleon visited Egypt to give it a light. Napoleon gave light to Egypt. It freed it from oppression. Let's see what kind of light was that. Was it not the same light that was brought to the samurais by the so-called merchant ships? Contemporaries wrote about Napoleon's visit in this way. Napoleon did a lot in Egypt. Really a lot. But a lot of what? And was it really about giving light or things that should not have been done by real gentlemen? Even mainstream chronicles mention that he lined up his soldiers against the Sphinx and ordered them to shoot in its face. Along with Napoleon, with his army, uh, were traveling many scientists, writers and painters. Let's see what were they exactly doing in Egypt. In the second half of 16th century, Pierre Bellon reports that the outer casing of the Great Pyramid is completely intact and looks newish. Jean Chenot is a secretary of the French Embassy in Egypt and in 1548 he records that most of the outer casing of the Great Pyramid is still intact. A very interesting medieval first-hand uh, witness gives us valuable information. The physician from Baghdad, Abd al-Latif, writes, the outer lining of the Great Pyramid is all covered with very ancient writing. Nobody understands anymore this writing. The inscriptions are so abundant that if somebody wanted to copy them, that would be more than 10,000 pages. A Masudi traveler from the Masudi tribe also shares his account that the Great Pyramid is all covered with various inscriptions in alphabets belonging to various nations that have disappeared a long time ago. Three other medieval travelers confirm basically the same thing and those are Ibn Hawkal, Abu Mashad Jafar and Wilhelm de Boldenzele. So the question arises, how come the locals in the area of Cairo started needing building material exactly when the West Europeans attacked Egypt. Were the locals not building houses before that? Were they building them out of water? No, they always needed building material. However, before Egypt was mercilessly attacked by the Western Europeans, the guardians of the pyramids and of the Egyptian culture were still living, still besides them, guarding them. Napoleon did not come to give light to Egypt. He came to destroy its culture. And that is why the lining of the magnificent Great Pyramid was turned into building material, maybe the locals were even invited and encouraged to take it away because the inscriptions on it were uncomfortable for the Scaliger Pitavius timeline. Napoleon also took priceless pieces of art to Europe where they lay till nowadays, most of them in the vaults because they are not suitable for public display. These are modern video games for kids. Since small, the children of the human race are brainwashed to become cruel parasites, 
destroying the culture that celebrates peace, beauty and harmony. They are trained since childhood to accept the parasitic, ugly, violent, cruel existence as something natural. These particular video games replicate exactly this historic period of the time when Napoleon raped Egypt. The modern kids are encouraged to take a virtual part in this shameful event and when they grow up they will be already trained in going to foreign lands to destroy peaceful cultures. So what about Champollion? In the archive of uh, the Italian city Turina, in year 1824, was written down the following. Champollion was very, very careful, especially when it comes to rewriting the names and dates connected with the rulers of Egypt. Rewriting. This was recorded by the Italian Posiner. Now this is interesting. Peter Ellerbacht writes about the visit of the architect Fritz Max Hessemer in 1829 in Egypt. Here it goes. I was very unlucky that I ended up in Egypt right after Champollion. What did that guy do over there? The tomb of fever was one of the best. It was uh, preserved in its pristine state. There were no damages. But after Champollion, the most beautiful items in it are simply broken down and they lay around into pieces. Those who have seen it before and after cannot recognize it. In the first half of the 19th century, a book was published under the name uh, wanderings of a Russian sailor in Egypt, Syria and Greece. He was a great admirer and he was always crying at the thought that he will finally see the miracles that uh, he has uh, heard about. He had the descriptions of Champollion, but when he went on the actual spots, the things were not there and he asked the locals what happened. He asked the local Arab where are the things that Champollion writes about and much to his surprise, the Arab uh, answered that it was Champollion himself who destroyed the inscriptions. The Arab at that time still himself remembers Champollion doing it. The seller was perplexed and asked why would he do that and the Arab answered Champollion wanted to be the only one who knows what was actually written there. Those of you who have visited Egypt are well aware that or even only from photos on the internet one can easily see that uh, many of the sites are in very poor condition and they are uh, really destroyed on purpose with uh, uh, hammers and chisels. With great authority the modern historians assure us that it was the Egyptians themselves who did all that uh, to supposedly uh, erase uh, the memory of pharaohs who they stopped liking. Of course, that is uh, fabricated only nowadays. There are no authentic records suggesting anything like this. And even if we just think with our own head a little bit, we'll find out that such a scenario is quite fishy. Why? The Egyptians obviously took great uh, care of decorating the world around them. They liked the beautiful things, it's obvious, from the items and buildings that they left behind. Obviously, they were not people that were devoid of artistic taste. And now, in case such people really wanted to get rid of the memories of a particular pharaoh, do you really believe that they will break down their beautiful buildings in the middle of their main squares with uh, in a most barbarian way with uh, hammers? Wouldn't they just uh, chisel out the name of the pharaoh and substitute it with uh, something else? Most likely this savage destruction of the beautiful Egyptian buildings started when uh, the Europeans came to bring light to Egypt.